Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, this is Paul LaChapelle, and I am the Extension Community Development Specialist based at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. That's in uh, South Central Montana. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today about community foundations as key players in rural development. Um, I'd just like to start off with a reminder if... Um, uh, if you would, could you mute your phone manually just to avoid any uh, background noise? Um, and we are also uh, recording today's webinar, and um, it will be archived and available uh, for um, uh, future listening and, and watching. I wanted to just start off um, providing a brief introduction of the project that we're working on here in Montana. This is a, a collaborative effort between the Anaconda Local Development Corporation, which is a small uh, not-for-profit uh, economic development organization located in central Montana, and the Montana Community Foundation based in Helena, Montana. You'll hear more about the uh, Montana Community Foundation in just a moment. And also the Montana State University Extension Service. And our objective is to build the capacity of local community foundations across Montana. Uh, we received funding from the USDA Rural Development Initiative, uh, which we had applied for um, uh, last year. The uh, RCDI uh, call for proposals, the Rural Community Development uh, Initiative call for, for proposals, appeared in the Federal Register in March of 2012. And our proposal uh, documented the need for uh, training of community foundation board members and citizens as a way to uh, enhance uh, rural economic development by uh, building leadership and uh, growing assets in a community and also granting uh, funds for rural development projects. This is a three-year, $150,000 project that requires a match uh, from um, our partners. And um, we seek to um, create a, a train-the-trainer program uh, to build the capacity of extension agents across the state of Montana uh, to either establish or build existing community foundations uh, in their communities or regions. So we view this uh, not only as a rural economic development initiative, uh, but also as a community development initiative in that we're building leadership capacity of the community uh, we're engaging the community in conversations about where they want to be, um, where they are, and where they want to be in the future. And we're also uh, actively trying to promote uh, teamwork and trust in the community. And we're also seeking uh, the active partnerships of a number of other organizations. Uh, a new organization based here in Montana is an advisory council um, uh, made up of uh, various members of community foundations across the state and other organizations such as uh, Philanthropy Northwest. So I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to uh, work with such a, a competent team of, of individuals. Um, Kathy Cooney from the Montana Community Foundation uh, brings over 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit world. And uh, Ray Lynn Hayes, uh, who will talk in, in just a few minutes, uh, is a former uh, county-based extension faculty member uh, who has worked extensively in community planning and uh, leadership training and rural economic development. So uh, the, the two of them will go into more detail about uh, community foundations uh, in general and uh, this project uh, in particular. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kathy Cooney from the Montana Community Foundation. Good morning, everyone. This is Kate, and I've spent the last 16 years working in the community foundation sector. I worked in Southern California for eight years in the Riverside San Bernardino area, which is mostly urban, but we did actually have a number of very remote, remote rural areas in our, our geographic service area. And then I moved to Montana, and I've been working for the Montana Community Foundation for the last eight years. And my primary function at the Community Foundation is to help communities, especially rural communities, start brand new community foundations and help sustain them through technical assistance and lots of cheerleading. So I have about 
30 minutes to review some basics about what community foundations are, um, what they look like in rural America, and then of course the, the three primary roles that community foundations do because we're very non-typical as nonprofits go and sometimes it's difficult for people to figure out what a community foundation actually does. And that even includes our volunteer board members in rural communities. They're not quite sure what a community foundation is supposed to do. So it's a little bit of a challenge. And then if we have some time at the end, I'd like to discuss with all of you some ways that rural development professionals can provide some expertise to support community foundations in rural areas. And by the way, on the slide you'll see a picture of the Muscleshell Valley Community Foundation Board of Directors, and this is a very typical community foundation based in Roundup, Montana, which is a, a small town of about 1,500 people. And uh, this is a very typical looking group of, of board members in Montana. Notice there are no suits or ties. So the first thing um, I did when I moved to Montana is I got rid of all my suits and high heels. Uh, because working in, in rural um, Montana is a very, very different, uh, uh, different situation than working in Southern California. So we're going to start with a survey question and we wanted to find out how many of you um, are familiar with uh, the community foundation that exists in your, your local area. So if everybody could pick the right answer really quickly and we'll figure out where everyone's at. Okay, is everybody uh, choose, making a choice? We're not seeing any. Oh, there we go. Now we're seeing some broadcast results. Take a few more seconds to determine how much interaction you have. Everyone dead? Oh gosh, well it's pretty clear where uh, where most people are. They've never had any interaction with community foundations. That's very interesting. But I'm also excited to see that there are actually some people on the call that are um, board members or other volunteers. So I hope that you can provide some some input for us. Thank you so much for for doing that. All right, let's move on. So what is a community foundation? You know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All community foundations are, um, but we don't do any direct service programs, which is very unusual. So we have all these volunteer board members in these new community foundations in rural areas, and they're used to volunteering for organizations like 4-H or Big Brothers Big Sisters or the local senior center, where they knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing. They were providing a very specific program. And then they get involved with starting a new community foundation, and they're very confused because they can't figure out what it is that we're supposed to actually be doing. Well, community foundations are in the business of building philanthropic assets, especially in the form of endowments for a specific geographic area or specific population within that area. Um, and again, those are concepts that most people don't deal with, uh, especially endowments. So it's kind of a hard sell. And then when you get into plan giving and bequests and all the rest of it, it becomes um, even more challenging for volunteers. But I do like the comparison that is often used in the community foundation sector about um, about philanthropic, uh, the, well, we compare ourselves to the United Way in terms of the form of our philanthropy. Um, United Way is often described as a philanthropic checking account of a community where they raise money and then it funnels through the United Way and it's immediately dispersed to provide direct, immediate services in the community. We, on the other hand, in community foundations, we're like the community's philanthropic savings account, where we're raising money for permanent endowments that will create income um, to provide grants for good projects and good programs in the community literally forever. 
And we also have a very important mission to help individuals leave a legacy to their community or to their mo most cherished causes. So there's that legacy piece that's also very, very important because it's difficult for individuals if they don't have the assets, for example, to set up a private foundation. It's hard for just normal you know, middle class folks um, to do something permanent and know that they're leaving a legacy behind that will be um, taken care of. And community foundations allow everyone to become a philanthropist by giving them that vehicle. And finally, we have a pretty new role in terms of leadership. Uh, when I started in the community foundation sector 16 years ago, we only talked about how much we were raising in terms of endowed assets and how much we were giving away in grants. We didn't talk about leadership. It's only been the last 10 years where leadership has become a huge issue, and that's because we can leverage our role as a neutral convener. We can leverage our role um, as a provider of resources in a community, and we are using that to become a catalyst to make things happen. Again, it's quite a challenging role um, for volunteers in rural communities to grasp. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the growth of community foundations. And this is pretty exciting. There was a great study done in 2009 that queried all of the major community foundations in the country, which again, you can see is about 744 at the time. There's probably more now. Um, over half of the responding community foundations had geographic affiliates. And most of those geographic affiliates, or at least a good portion of them, were actually in rural areas. And this points out a really important phenomenon in the community foundation sector. And that is that most rural communities can't really support a professionally staffed community foundation. You know, it's very expensive. You need a lot of technical expertise, resources. Um, but most professionally staffed community foundations can use um, their resources to go to the outlying communities in their service area and help start grassroots community foundations that are affiliated with the what we call lead foundation. And this is becoming more and more of a common model. In Montana, for example, we have 75 community foundations or community endowment funds. Only 18 of them have any staff, and almost all of those 18 are one staff person part-time working in a rural community. So it makes total sense that we as a statewide foundation, we have $60 million in assets, which is not you know, a really big community foundation, but still um, we are certainly by far the biggest community foundation in the state. It makes sense that we use our resources to go to outlying areas and help community foundations get started where we provide all the investment management, we provide you know, the accounting system, um, half of our 45 affiliates operate under our 501c3, so they don't have any of um, the concerns about dealing with the IRS or filling out 990s. So it makes it a lot easier for a group of volunteers in a tiny little community to start a community foundation and start an endowment because they know they have the expertise of a larger community foundation to help them. And I will say, that the Aspen Institute has been really instrumental in doing this wonderful work. And the picture you see in the corner there is that of Janet Topolsky. She is the expert nationally on rural philanthropy and rural community foundations. She is a wonderful speaker. She's really funny. And I strongly recommend, if you're real interested in pursuing this topic of rural philanthropy, have Janet Topolsky come to one of your conferences. Um, she is a great speaker and doing wonderful cutting edge work. Now I will say just to finish up, even though that this is a really common model now with a lead foundation having lots of geographic affiliates in rural areas, um, it is quite um, a daunting prospect actually for the lead foundation. It's, it's very expensive. Um, the amount of assets you can raise uh, as a result of having rural affiliates um, does not really compensate for the amount of resources that it uh, ex that you will expend to actually um, provide the technical assistance. Um, for me, for example, 
Um, our community foundation is based in Helena, which is our state capital. It's kind of in a little closer to the central part of the state. I live in northwest Montana, which is three and a half hours away from Helena. And my furthest client, uh, again, we have 45 affiliates. The furthest affiliate for me is in southeast Montana. I have to drive 12 hours to get to them and to provide technical assistance. So it is no easy task um, to provide those services to far-flung rural areas. It involves a lot of time on the road, a lot of expense. But it's certainly something at the Montana Community Foundation that we're very committed to, and uh, we are certainly not the only one. There are a lot of um, major community foundations around the, the nation that are committing huge resources to make uh, philanthropy happen in rural communities. All right, moving on. Any questions so far? Feel free to just break in and, and ask any questions or use the chat box there in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of your screen. We're going to talk about intergenerational transfer of wealth now, and I think it's probably a concept that most of you have heard about. We're going through the biggest intergenerational transfer of wealth in the history of the U.S., and Boston College spearheaded um, the collection of data around intergenerational transfer of wealth, but it's something that's talked about in the nonprofit sector a lot. But the reason it's really important for rural areas is that this intergenerational transfer of wealth is happening even faster because we have an older population. For example, in Montana, we're the fourth oldest state in the, in the country now. And in eastern Montana, in our rural areas, um, the population is even older because the kids are leaving the rural areas to go away, to go to school, or to start their careers. So what's happening is that pre-World War II generation, they accumulated a lot of assets. They're now slowly passing away and leaving their assets to their kids as baby boomers. And it, just in, in Montana, we have a transfer of wealth of $12 billion happening over just 10 years. So that gives us an idea of what the potential is. The idea is that we are going to those people who have accumulated assets and saying, hey, think about leaving something behind your community. In Montana, we have a really long history of exporting our assets, starting with the, coal, uh, the copper and silver mines in Butte um, that funded cultural institutions in New York City, not in Butte. Um, and it certainly continues to this day because when we have people that have spent their lifetime living in a small community in rural Montana and they have a small business or a ranch or a farm, if they pass away and leave all of their assets to their kids, the money is not staying in those communities. That money is probably not even staying in Montana because the kids have left. So what we're asking people to do is leave just a small portion of their wealth behind for their community to leave that permanent legacy. And you know that's a hard sell, I will tell you, for volunteers in rural community foundations. They get fundraising, and fundraising is where you put on your little wine and cheese fundraiser, or you send out a fundraising letter, and you get those $50 or $100 checks. And that's great, but that's not really the type of work that we are ideally suited to as community foundations. We want to leave that more for regular nonprofits that need to raise money right away for the program. We're trying to create a permanent legacy, um, and that means asset development. That means talking to people about leaving part of their um, worldly possessions, their, the assets they've accumulated over a lifetime. That means talking to people about plan giving. Um, that's, again, a much more complicated process for volunteers, but it's a really important role to play. And we, luckily, in Montana, um, do have some great role models. We're kind of new at this game of asset development, but Nebraska Community Fishing is a sterling role model, and they are the national stars. They spearheaded transfer of wealth studies. Um, they've really talked to people in their communities about um, leaving um, a legacy gift behind. In fact, they're not just talking about 5% like we are. We're saying, hey, leave 5% back to your community. In Nebraska and South Dakota, um, where they've been fabulously successful also, they're talking about treating their, their community as a net child. If you have three kids, divide your estate into quarters and leave one quarter 
back to the community where you raised your kids, where you had your business, um, you know, where you lived for many years, um, that's really, you know, nurtured you. Uh, and that seems to be resonating with a lot of people who feel that sense of, of uh, commitment to their hometown. All right, we're going to go on to the next survey question. So I'm interested in knowing if you have seen community foundations active in the rural communities that you serve. So if you could take just a few minutes and answer the question. We'll see where everybody is. And Ansi has a question in the chat box. All right. Oh, the, the national role model is Nebraska Community Foundation. They're so good at this work. We just hate them. No, just kidding. They're really, really good. So we figure, well, if they can do it in Nebraska, we can do this in Montana. All right. I think a lot of people have answered. Let's see. Well, good. I'm glad only two people said that they didn't think there were, there were active community foundations in their service areas. So that's really good. Uh, so yes, you see community foundations making grants, and there are a number of them uh, apparently talking about transfer wealth. That's wonderful. Good. All right. Is everyone finished? Okay. Not bad. That was better than I thought. Moving on. Let's see how we're doing time-wise. Okay, let's talk real briefly about the three roles of a community foundation. Because again, we are a very atypical nonprofit. Asset development, we've briefly discussed, um, but this is our challenge with asset development. Over 80% of Americans give to charity during their lifetime. And we, on this call, probably all of us have our favorite charities that we give to every year. But when you look at the percentage of Americans that give to charity after they've passed away through a bequest or a planned gift, that falls from about 83% down to about 4%. That is tiny. So that is the uphill battle that we're going against is culturally people are used to leaving their assets to their children and to their family members. And sometimes those are family members they don't even like. I don't know if you have that um, history in your family, but I know people that uh, have given their money to relatives that they never saw and didn't like much just because they thought they had to give their assets to family. And what we're trying to encourage people to do is think of their community as part of their family and, again, give something back that will benefit that community in perpetuity. So we're fairly a uh, fairly new sector. Even the Montana Community Foundation, which is the second oldest community foundation in the state, we are only 25 years old. Started in 1988. Um, in contrast, there are lots of areas in the country where community foundations have existed for a lot longer. Um, for example, the community foundation I worked for in Riverside was started in. Um, 1941. Um, so you can see that the, by the time I started working for that community foundation in the late 90s, we were giving away money from endowment funds that had been around for 45, 50 years. Well, in Montana, um, we started out kind of slow, 1988, and we, after 25 years, a lot of our affiliates are brand new. Um, many of them have started in the last 10 years. Um, some of them you know, much more recently, we've started two new community foundations in Montana just in the last year. And the drawback, of course, is that it takes a lot of donor cultivation, a lot of relationship building with donors over a number of years before somebody is going to um, trust you enough to leave you a bequest. So with our community foundation sector really growing over the last five or ten years, it may take 30 or 40 years to really see the fruits of that labor and to see the results from talking about um, you know, leaving a legacy gift and, and that, that type of, of legacy language. But we, we are slowly starting to see some of those success stories. Some of them are coming faster than we had originally anticipated. 
I will talk about Weibo. Weibo, Montana is um, the county seat of Weibo County. And Weibo is right up against the South Dakota border. It is a very small town. It is one square mile in size and has a population of 489 people. And this is the county seat. Uh, now, that was in 2010, the 2010 census, so it's probably smaller than that now because every time I go there, they say they, they have a lot more funerals than they do births, unfortunately. But it's a cute little town. It's a farming community. Um, and it used to be quite a hopping little town in the frontier days. Well, Weibo, um, in a sign of great optimism on their part, they decided in 2008 to start a community foundation because they wanted some resources to um, enrich their community and make it an even better place to live. So they have a five-member advisory committee. They operate under our 501c3, so they're one of our affiliates. And they have built an endowment after five years of work of around $42,000. And they've worked really hard to raise that $42,000. So they have a little grant program and they have a little money to give away every year. Well, after they started their community foundation, they sent out their newsletters and their appeals to anyone that they thought might be interested. And the news of their efforts reached a woman named Sue, whose last name I will not mention. But she actually lives in Minnesota, and she's lived in Minnesota all of her life. But her grandparents used to run the hotel in Weibo probably 50 years ago. And Sue actually spent one summer in Weibo when she was growing up, and it must have lasted quite, it must have made quite an impression um, because she has obviously some really great memories of this little town. When she heard that Weibo had started in a community foundation there, she decided that that would be a great vehicle to leave a gift behind for the community. So in addition, over the last five years, she has given over $7,000 in contributions to this little community foundation, which is a huge amount of money for us from one person. Um, but in addition, she actually put the Weibo Endowment Foundation in her will. When she passes away, the town of Weibo will get a six-figure gift from Sue. So I think that is a classic example of how one person or even a small group of people can make a huge difference in the future of a small rural community. Um, and they haven't received the money yet, of course, and they won't receive the money probably for many years, but it doesn't matter. Just the fact that she has told them that she is going to be making this legacy gift has given them such a sense of, of optimism, like, wow, this, this is a story that will resonate with people. And this idea about leaving a legacy back to Weibo to make this a strong community um, is just a wonderful, upbeat um, upbeat theme because a lot of these small rural communities in eastern Montana feel so downtrodden. You know, the kids leave, the population keeps dropping, they keep worrying about whether they're even going to have a community in a few years. So it's a way for them to turn around their attitude and feel more optimistic and hopeful about their future um, by creating these endowments making these grants, doing these wonderful projects in their community to make them attractive places, hopefully, for kids to move home to. So that's what it's all about for us. So that's my story about Weibo, Montana. Uh, oh, and Kathy has a little comment. Um, Kathy lives in Minnesota, and they have a uh, – Regional Planning Council with a large umbrella with many towns of community foundations underneath it. And uh, again, Far Fargo, there's a very large community foundation with, uh, with many pots of money. And, that's, uh, and Kathy, that's very typical. Most community foundations have many endowment funds. In fact, the Montana Community Foundation has, oh gosh, about 600 different endowment funds. Um, most rural community foundations start with one um, unrestricted endowment fund that they can build with various uh, donations so they can make unrestricted grants in their community. But certainly we're now starting to see some of our rural community foundations actually attract other types of endowment funds like scholarship funds or funds to benefit specific nonprofits in their communities. And that's great too. We, we want to offer donors the opportunity to leave all kinds of of gifts to benefit their, their hometowns. So let's move on. All right, grant making. That's our second role. 
And, you know, you would think that this would be such an easy thing to do. I mean, how, how hard is it to, le- to leave money, right, to, to give away money? But in actuality, um, giving away money might be easy, but giving away money well is extremely difficult. And it is also very challenging for community foundation volunteers to get their, their head around what grant making should look like. Of course, you know, as grant making professionals, we want them to use data, we want them to be very thoughtful about what the needs are in the community, and we want them to think about social change models and, and, and work all this out before they start spending their money. Um, and most volunteers in a new community foundation, they're going to make lots of feel-good grants. Um, but that is one thing that we're really working on in Montana, and that's actually part of our USDA grant. We're going to be offering some intensive grant-making training uh, to start turning around those attitudes about giving away money. We don't want it to feel good when we give some grants away from a rural community foundation endowment. We want to see it make an impact in those communities. Um, but even just having a pot of, of money to make grants every year is so hugely important. It really, again, changes the atmosphere in some of these small towns. Instead of them feeling like um, they are you know, the victims of forces beyond their control, they can start feeling like, like they have control over something. Um, again, most communities are very cognizant of the fact that federal funding is declining. Um, you know, in Montana, uh, state funding for many projects is, is very limited. Um, so this is a way for them to feel like they have some control over their future by building this endowment fund where the money is completely controlled locally. Um, they have the choice about where that money, is, that income is spent every year. Again, that can be a really exciting thing for these volunteers. Even if they start out with fairly unsophisticated grant program, um, they get more sophisticated as, as time goes on. And most community foundations, you're not familiar with how they work, um, they have the income off of endowment, usually 4 or 5% of the assets, and then they do a competitive grant program once a year. That's usually how you get started. You let everybody in the community know that you have this pot of money, you have an application process. The volunteers, uh, the board members of these community foundations look over a stack of grant proposals and then decide what sounds good, and then they make the grants. Um, one nice thing for these grassroots nonprofit organizations in rural communities is that most of them would never, ever, ever do any grant writing or ever apply for a foundation grant for a, you know, a large private foundation outside of their own community. The fact that they have this local community foundation and a fairly um, easy accessible grant process um, is such an opportunity for, for most of them because, again, most of them don't do any grant writing. They would never have access to grant money if they didn't have a community foundation right there in their, their own town. Um, now, one of my personal challenges, I will tell you, uh, is helping the um, – oops, okay um, – is helping community foundations become more strategic using data. Um, to do grant, good grant making. Um, and so let's see, we advance the slide and, okay, I think we have, okay, there we go. Um, some recommended grant strategies is to use data um, to do some capacity building for local community foundations. Um, most community foundations don't have the resources to provide a lot of operating support for nonprofits. But certainly, we can fund um, one-time projects, things that most nonprofits would have difficulty. So for example, if your small rural fire department can do you know, their pancake breakfast to do their basic maintenance on their vehicles and pay the light bill, they still may not have the money to buy safety equipment for their volunteers. That's a large one-time expense. That's what rural community foundations are ideally suited for, is those type of special projects. I did want to give you know, some special recognition to Park County Community Foundation. Uh, again, we, we do a lot of feel-good grant making right now in Montana. That's something we really want to work on. But Park County has been spectacularly successful in doing 
um, a much more sophisticated job of grant making through a major indicators project where they collected, um, now they are one of the few that have a um, full-time staff person, by the way, um, but they collected a, a lot of data from the state, um, local county data, um, federal census data, and they came up with this huge indicator project where they put all the data together, they put it on the website, they shared it with the community, and they used this data about their community to direct their making. And one specific story I have from, from Ted Madden in, in Park County was that they received a grant proposal once for a suicide prevention program. You know, and, and everybody wants to you know, help with suicide prevention. Um, even one suicide is too many suicides, obviously. But when they looked at their data, they saw that they are way, way below average um, in terms of suicides per capita in Park County. But on the other hand, they have a really serious problem with affordable daycare in Park County. It's a huge issue for their residents. So they made the very difficult decision based on the data um, and the community input. They decided to not fund the suicide prevention program that was asking for a grant, and instead they funneled more money into um, affordable daycare centers. And that's the type of of uh, really thoughtful uh, grant making, database grant making that we like to see. All right, last but not least, our third role, again, a fairly new role for us is leadership. Very ambitious role to take. Um, it's, it's not passive, like when you do a competitive grant program and you're reading over a bunch of proposals and deciding what to fund, that's a pretty passive role. It's, it's not that hard for the volunteers to do. Leadership is very proactive. And I'll just give you some examples of the leadership projects we see taking place in rural communities. Um, definitely nonprofit capacity building where you can help the whole sector as, um, as um, by providing you know some training for local community or local nonprofits um, and nonprofit management and other important uh, nonprofit topics. Fiscal sponsorship, one of uh, the surprising things that I learned when I moved to Montana is that there are rural communities with literally no nonprofits, no 501c3s, or maybe just one or two. Um, so it's actually, even if you have grant money, it's hard to make grants. And it's certainly hard for those communities to bring in funding from outside funders because most funders want to fund 501c3 organizations. So one of the roles that our community foundations are playing is they're getting their 501c3 status and they're providing the fiscal sponsorship um, role for local projects just so you know there's some entity in that community to accept grant money. And again, coming from you know Riverside and San Bernardino where we had what, gosh, thousands and thousands and thousands of 501c3 organizations, it was quite a shock when I found out what a huge issue this is in rural communities. Anyway, there's lots of ways that uh, community foundations can play that leadership role, but the main um, the main reason we're so interested in leadership is that we are true. We can truly be a neutral convener, since we're not doing specific programs. Um, we don't have our own agenda, so to speak. We just want to make the community a better place to live, and so that's why it's really nice to have the community foundation be that neutral convener and be that catalyst. Especially since we have money we can bring to the table. Um, and hopefully leverage that with attracting funding from other, um, other sources. And another nice thing for our brand new community foundations is that they can do leadership even if they don't have a lot of m grant money to spend. I wanted to, to talk specifically about Red Lodge Area Community Foundation. And Red Lodge, if you've not been there, is an absolutely adorable community um, right up against the Beartooth Mountains. It's one of the most spectacular places in Montana, but they have a Red Hot Community Foundation. They are amazing, and they do a ton of leadership. And um, just in the last six weeks, um, they had the opportunity to provide leadership as a convener um, by recreating their local economic development corporation. And what happened is they had a little uh, economic development corporation that had been operating for years, but the board members were very burned out and they decided to just let it go. 
they were done. They were going to quit and go home and just let the thing die. And the Community Foundation Board found out about this and said, well, you know, we, we think there is interest in keeping this going. So they convened a series of community meetings, which again, not very expensive. They have their own facility, so they were able to use their conference room. They you know, provided a pot of coffee and a bunch of cookies, brought people in. They got a tremendous response. They got lots of people that came in and said, hey, this is too important. We need an economic development organization in Red Lodge. And as a result of this series of community meetings, they were able to recruit um, new board members for this organization and totally revitalize it. So now the, the um, Economic Development Corporation has survived. It's got a new lease on life and it's because the Community Foundation um, was the community convener to bring that to the table and to bring that to everyone's attention. So we were very proud of them for doing that and it was very proactive on their part. Now we did have some a question from Suzette, Dave, and Chelsea. Um, do you have any examples of community foundation that uses a community's CED plan, a regional plan that substantially informs their grant making? Ha! Huh. You know, I don't know. I would imagine Park County um, incorporated that as part of their indicators project because they used all the data. Um, they could find both state, federal, and, and regional data. So I would think that that um, would be part of what they looked at. But um, no, I don't actually have any example, other examples of communities that have used that regional plan. But that is um, one of the things that we're interested in, in doing is having, having professionals like all of you um, become involved with your local community foundation and bring some of this to the table because probably most of the volunteers in rural community foundations don't even know about these regional plans. You know, we have a lot of people that are uh, civic volunteers or small business people, um, you know, the local insurance agents or the local bankers, and they don't always know about these regional plans. So I think that is uh, fab a fabulous example of how all of you can help your local community foundations. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear any examples or ideas you have about how to help uh, your local community foundation. You can either um, let us know now or put it in the chat box. And then we're going to turn it, into, turn it over to Ray Lynn. Thanks, Kathy. Um, you know, Dave, uh, Dave actually brought up an interesting point, and that is, is something that I noticed and I'm, I'm excited about using this project to uh, to address that need. In working as an extension agent, I was very familiar with the SEDS process. We use that to plan out a lot of our, um, our training and our programs, identify what the needs were, and, and use that for deciding what projects we would, would fund um, looking more on large-scale funding. Uh, the interesting thing that, that I've discovered in working with the community foundations is Kathy noted that many of them are volunteers and aren't necessarily familiar with the ways that, um, that communities may work or that there even is a community plan or a SEDS document and working in more of a regional uh, arena. So one of the things that we're looking to accomplish with this project is having more dialogue and people to understand what one another um, and the, the other organizations do. So one of the, the purposes that, that I'm trying to um, do with the, the curriculum and training part of it is to start having some community dialogues and develop a system change so that people are working together and, and not necessarily duplicating services, but understanding what those plans are and contributing more to those. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit more in, in the, uh, the slides that I have to follow. But to begin with, um, looking at when, when this project started, it was actually um, a, an idea of, of trying to meet the needs in Montana. As we talk about being rural nature, um, in Montana we have an area that is approximately, well, it's a little over 147,000 square miles to cover. So looking at Kathy trying to develop um, community foundations, and she's talked a little bit about how they can benefit a community and be involved in roles in, in community development and economic development, that's difficult for one person to try to train all of those community foundations or work with all of those community foundations. 
so um, and and looking at the average community size, when we talk about building capacity, our rural areas in, in our communities, many of them, the average size community in Montana can be anywhere from 100 to 1,000 people, since our state has less than a million people total in population. So with this grant in mind, um, Paul and Kathy and my predecessor, Betsy Webb, established a committee to assess the needs and opportunities for skill development that could result in increased capacity for local community foundations. Uh, Kathy kind of hit on this earlier, but many of our citizens in, in our rural areas are used to donating their time, but haven't really necessarily thought about how they can contribute financial or property assets to leave a legacy and impact those communities. And we are seeing less and less funding coming from federal and the state level that's putting more pressure on local communities to be able to um, address many of their emerging needs, whether that be infrastructure with water and sewer systems or looking at, at um, program needs, such as is potentially their 4-H program or, or their girls and boys program that could use some additional funding. So the goal of this program is to increase the assets of the local community foundation, establish permanent resources, and then have that be more of a, a planned effort in spending for strategic community development in rural areas, which that really does get back to your point, Dave, of, of dealing um, with and using those said documents for this purpose. To accomplish that goal, the committee actually um, established training objectives, delivery options, and implement implementation strategies for this project. Many, as when they convened the committee, they, they determined what um, they thought to be many of the training objectives that would um, lend itself to a successful implementation of this project and its goals of increasing capacity among the community foundations. One of the first things that we looked at doing was, is, is, and it was um, sort of noted in here at the beginning of the question of, of people's familiarity with what goes on in the local community foundation, whether or not they even exist, and then what their primary responsibilities are and how they can contribute to a community's function and uh, cap capacity and success. So one of the things that we started out by doing with creating our curriculum and training is to let people know um, what that, that entails. And then talking to, we, we decided with our initial year one was to look at involving a lot of extension agents. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the land grant universities and the extension programs, but in Montana we have an extension program in every state, or excuse me, in every county in the state. Um, they're wonderful at being a portal to bring educational resources to meet local needs. They're very familiar with what goes on in their community, and they're excellent at mobilizing community groups. So our first training uh, target was to target extension faculty members, but also to welcome other community members who wanted to begin that collaborative effort. So with that, we started out by um, introducing them to what a local foundation is, what it does, how they can contribute to a community. And then the second part of that was to get into um, teaching them the extension agents have some familiarity, but developing a train the trainer program that these groups of boards and uh, extension agents could work together to develop a strategic planning process. And that ties into using those said documents or to identify not only what the community wants to spend their um, resources on, but looking at, at planning that out and determining what might be the highest priorities and developing some short-term as well as some long-term plans with not only how that community foundation will function, but how it can contribute to the local economic and community development efforts. The third component of that that we're looking at train the training objective in year one is to focus on facilitation and um, to help these groups be more successful with their, meet, with their meetings, as well as assessing community needs, managing conflict, and increasing the quality of dialogue within the community. Moving then into the training objectives for year two, we're looking at getting together, um, focusing on leadership and governance. Many, as, as Kathy had indicated earlier, in a typical board or um, 
group of volunteers in our state, not and I'm sure that this is typical around the country, is that not only are they volunteering in their local community foundation, but they're probably also volunteering with their local 4-H group, their Girl Scouts, their Boy Scouts, the church, the Chamber of Commerce, and um, many of them become burned out. So as she had mentioned in one of her previous counties was that they had just decided with their economic development group, they were going to let that just die because people were tired and couldn't do that any longer. So then we may get someone new who, come, who comes up, but not necessarily have an understanding of how boards work, what their responsibilities are, and the, uh, that goes along with, with having an, an organization be sustainable. So teaching them about leadership, how to run those um, groups, and then having some community dialogue. Uh, I think that looking at, um, as an extension agent, when, I, when we talked about community dialogue, for me that often times took place in the grocery store. Um, when we had our, our mill that closed and employed the majority of people in our community, we'd have a lot of people stop me in, in the aisle while I was picking out my lettuce saying, what are we going to do with this? How do we address this? And so what we're looking at is, is helping communities and teaching the, the individuals who come to this program how to have a community dialogue so that it doesn't occur just between a couple of people in a local coffee shop or at the post office or the grocery store, but in fact that it's organized, constructive, and not polarizing. Um, many of these issues as we're, we're looking in, in our rural communities as well as nationwide are, it can become polarizing. So it's a way to be able to have a positive dialogue to help solve pro problems, identify needs and assets, and then also to recognize the progress that people are making in their communities. Looking towards asset development, we're looking at increasing sustainability and developing permanent resources rather than just having a couple of fundraising events, helping people understand how they can control the destiny of their community and be an active part of that. Um, as Kathy talked much about the transfer of wealth, a lot of that money is leaving Montana and we're having um, aging infrastructure issues that need to be dealt with. So this is the way that we can actually create some of that and control our own destiny or each community's destiny as to what they think is being important. And then looking at the grant making and teaching people how to do that responsibly um, and raising money with a purpose so that people are more apt to give to those projects. In year three, then we'll move into looking at marketing communications and then being able to help the community foundations actually communicate what the impacts that they have made within them then to also establish some effective collaborations and help people understand the role that they can play within public policy and making a change in their community or statewide, as well as contributing to that systems change where people are no longer operating in silos so that we have the community foundation maybe um, focusing just on, on raising assets and then giving out money but not necessarily understanding what the priorities within their communities are. So that's where we're looking as far as training objectives, the main topics that we'll be working on is, is teaching the extension agents and board members. I want to talk to you a little bit now about our training delivery mode of how we will make that happen. Initially, I had mentioned that we were using MSU extension agents as the portal and the target as the train the trainer because it is, we are so spread out and so rural, it's difficult for um, one person, let alone a small group of people, to get out and train in all of these communities. We want this effort to be sustainable, and so we would also then like it to be able to continue throughout time um, and not just be something that would be a, a training that people would come to, attend for, um, and then once those people who attended the training left the community or went off that board, that, that, that training was gone. So we want to be sure that this continues. And that's when we'll have the extension agents involved in each of the communities. We will also have regional meetings um, where we'll target not only just the extension agents who will be facilitating this, this training and taking it back to their communities, but also offering regional opportunities that, that will um, impact a lot of the community foundations. And then that same effort will be repeated on a statewide conference, recognizing though that 
much of Montana, there is a lot of driving and windshield time. So sometimes, particularly given the weather or the timing, whether it may be in the fall and we're harvesting or in the summer and people are cutting hay, that sometimes we can't get those volunteers out to training. So we're, we'll also be offering webinars that, that communities can participate in. Finally, we want it to be more than just a training. We want to see communities implement these strategies and this model and then be able to see a difference in their community. So we'll start out with the training with the MSU Extension Agents as well as Community Foundation Boards who we hope will be working together um, as in sort of a team collaborative effort to implement these strategies and programs in their communities. One of the things that we're doing is putting together a video that explains transfer of wealth. And then we're asking each of these communities to host a transfer of wealth event where we can have a community foundation and begin to build those collaborations and see a systems change, discussing at that time of what their, it, what their community situation looks like, what, how much, what do they have for assets and, and plan giving. And then with that, where are they planning to use um, that information as far as spending and um, contributing to their, their projects such as, as, um, as infrastructure or looking at different changes. And finally then to develop a strategic plan. Um, have some assessments and then track that as to what is working, what isn't, and that's sort of bringing in that the concept of using that the SEDS document and, and in any other data that exists so that we don't have groups who are duplicating um, assessments and surveys throughout the community so that people decide that they no longer wish to participate in that. So to try, to try to get people to be more engaged in their community and to have more control over that destiny. With that, then, as we're closing in on our time frame, I want to see if there are any questions out there on our curriculum or our training or the project in general. It's a quiet group, huh? <laughs> it seems that um, it seems that Montana has a kind of. Uh, statewide community foundation structure? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, Montana Community Foundation has the majority, it has a relationship with the majority of the community foundations in the state. Because there are 75 overall, um, we have 45 affiliates. But there are lots of community foundations that are independent, and then there's another community foundation, Central Montana, that has 10 affiliates. So most of the community foundations are affiliated with a, a lead foundation, but not everyone. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. I I was thinking, I guess, more of the model that I've seen operate in Arkansas. And I'm actually in Mississippi, and I'm just wondering because there are a limited number of philanthropic structures, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, there um, are few um, corporate foundations or um, foundations in general, and there are, a, I think, a sparse number, and I'm not sure today what the number of community foundations are, but was just trying to figure how um, the Montana um, practices or models may be used in a community, in a state where there are a limited number of foundations in mm -hmm. existence. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, if you want to see what community foundations exist in your state, you can go to the Council on Foundations website at cof.org, and they, you know, you can get um, a list of the community foundations in your area. Um, Mississippi is probably a philanthropic divide state, just like Montana is. In other words, there are about um, 10 states in the country that have a very, very low level of foundation assets, very few foundations. Um, most of them are, are, are rural states, and uh, Montana definitely is one of them. Um, so yeah, we, we do struggle. Um, we don't have a lot of resources in Montana for philanthropy, but we have found that a, a few of the private or corporate foundations in our state 
are interested in seeing philanthropy grow and they have provided the support, for example, to start our statewide Community Foundation Council, which is actually morphing into a Community Foundation Association where um, we can work together to provide training for each other and to um, share our resources together. Um, and we're basing that on the Michigan uh, model. There is an association of community foundations in Michigan, and they've been very helpful in sharing what they do, um, and we're trying to, to emulate that. Um, I know Arkansas is a great model too because we've actually had uh, a lot of conversations with Arkansas Community Foundation because they do a, a tremendous job and we want to be like them too. So they have an affiliate lead um, model where the lead foundation is providing a lot of resources and help to start community foundations all over Arkansas. So there's some great models out there. Thank you. Um, we have a question on the chat box from Chris. Um, has any thought been given to encouraging individual town to think on a regional scale in terms of philanthropy, um, regional being multi-county? Um, well, uh, boy, that's, that's a good question. I think it's been, um, I think we've been mainly focused on helping community foundations get started uh, for very specific towns or counties and doing grant making there. So we haven't even gotten to the point where we have enough resources to actually do regional grant making. But it certainly makes sense because a lot of um, community issues, uh, for example, domestic violence, is really addressed on a regional level. These little rural counties don't have their own service providers. And so in order to really um, have an impact on an issue like domestic violence, you have to fund agencies that serve maybe 10 counties. Um, and so all those community foundations should really be getting together and pooling their grant money to help those, those type of um, organizations. So yeah, I think that's something that we'll be looking at in the future. Um, right now, our typical grants from our community foundations is somewhere in the range of um, $500 to $2,500. So the grants are tiny, um, but once those endowments are bigger and the grant amounts are bigger, I think uh, there'll be more interest in, in doing some grant making um, to fund larger organizations. I think the statewide association will help too in terms of being um, everyone thinking more regionally. And we have a question um, we skipped from Kathy. How do you deal with competitive groups, sports versus art, et cetera, and then getting burned because you favor another cause rather than the donor's cause? Um, when donors give to a community foundation to the unrestricted endowment, there's um, there's no strings attached. I think everybody it's it's understood that the board uh, of the community foundation is going to be making the grant decisions, not the donors. If donors want to have um, much more targeted grant making, they can set up their own endowment fund where they they fund something specific. Like um, the Greater Glendive Community Foundation is an example. Rural community, Eastern Montana, they have an unrestricted endowment they're building, but um, one of the families in town set up a, a named family endowment underneath their umbrella that actually provides maintenance for the, the sports fields, the baseball and soccer fields, because they love youth sport and that's what they wanted to do. So that's what we talk about in the community foundation sector about helping people leave their legacy. It doesn't have to be just supporting an unrestricted endowment for a community. It can be setting up an aimed family fund underneath the community foundation that does something very specific um, in per perpetuity. Any other questions? Janelle, you're sending us some great resources about, uh, about Michigan, about Transfer of Wealth Studies. We're going to look into that toolkit. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, happy to answer any questions from Michigan. If anyone has um, future issues they'd like to discuss, I've already forwarded my email. So please take advantage. Um, you're doing great That's work, awesome. and we love to see it spreading across the country. Community foundations are wonderful organizations to be partnering with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ray Lynn, if there are no more questions, why don't we pass this along to the
been able to hear all of it um, because there's lots of good things going on. And I am State Director of USDA Rural Development in Nebraska and am also uh, serving as chair of a re recently constituted task force on rural philanthropy um, through the Undersecretary's Office. Um, Doug O'Brien was previously Deputy Undersecretary and now is uh, serving as the acting Undersecretary, and I've also been working with Chris Beck, and I think Chris is on the line as well. Um, we have a group of state directors and um, career people on our uh, task force, and uh, I believe Brian Queen from um, South Carolina is on the phone as well, or on the webinar as well. Uh, so we're pleased to have these group of people working. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. I have been working in rural development in the private sector and in state and federal government uh, pretty much all of my um, adult life. I started out as a newspaper uh, owner, publisher, editor in southeast Nebraska and grew a company from about three employees to 120 and then went into state government in 1990, um, served as the first chair of the Nebraska Rural Development Commission, which recommended the formation of the Nebraska Community Foundation. That is a statewide community foundation that operates now in just about every one of the 93 counties in the state. I served as the first chair of that and then as the first uh, full-time president of the Community Foundation after I left state government. And I have been here now for almost three years at USDA. Um, and I, I am a firm believer in community foundations, but I am also a firm believer in collaboration and working together with uh, any partner that we can find, whether it's community foundations, private foundations, corporate foundations, or government funding. Uh, and I wanted to start out this webinar by focusing in on Secretary Vilsack's leadership in this area. Um, he ha uh, uses the terminology pathways to rural prosperity in many of his speeches, um, focusing in on job creation and wealth creation in our rural communities across the United States. Um, and he, he focuses not only on entrepreneurship and job creation at the micro level, but also focuses on bioenergy, on food systems, just a, a wealth of things that can occur in rural communities that create wealth and jobs. Um, wealth retention and the transfer of wealth is also a critical part of this, as you've already heard with the previous presentation. Uh, another critical part is to encourage rural investors to bring some of their investments home from Wall Street uh, to provide access to capital in their own communities and regions and state. And of course, another critical part is addressing rural poverty and our access to local foods to healthy few foods. Uh, and Governor or uh, Senator. <laughs> The governor, now Secretary Vilsack, um, first started this work with the Council on Foundations with a general memorandum of understanding that was signed in August of 2011, so almost two years ago, and then the specific guidance menu, memo was signed in February of 2012. Uh, and so the, the key objectives of this are to engage philanthropy in uh, convening efforts to address rural wealth, um, but also to leverage the resources um, that we collectively have through government and philanthropy for our rural communities. Um, and some of the work that's been going on since this MOU was signed uh, was to identify uh, funding gaps, and also to identify programs that are specifically suited to collaboration between 
USDA Rural Development and Philanthropy. And so there's some joint research that's been going on, there's case studies, um, and also a key component is identifying the stakeholders in this, which are the, the foundations, which philanthropy groups are most interested in rural America and solving some of the funding gaps and the needs that we have in rural communities. Uh, and then um, also very important, I think, is that we find a way to institutionalize this practice of working between government and philanthropy for the betterment of our rural communities. Uh, some of the highlights uh, that have occurred since the MOU was, was signed uh, just a little bit more than a year ago um, was one of uh, the efforts last year between USDA Rural Development and the Economic Development Administration and the Rural Jobs Accelerator. And I'll present some additional information on that in just a little bit. Certainly there is the transfer of wealth opportunity. Uh, there is more and more focus on this as our Mo Montana presenters indicated and, and certainly as uh, the Michigan Council on Foundations and others uh, have done this focus. I might add here that uh, the first transfer of wealth study was done by Boston uh, college researchers back in, I believe, 1999, and uh, the Nebraska Community Foundation was fortunate enough to get a grant in 2000-2001 that allowed us to do the first state-specific transfer of wealth study. Uh, and it was a true eye-opener eye to our communities. They just didn't realize how much wealth that was held by residents of their communities. And it's become a wonderful tool to encourage people to uh, look at endowment building in their communities. One of my favorite stories is about a, a ranching woman out in the sand hills of Nebraska who decided she was going to help build an endowment in her home community. This is a community of less than 500 people. And uh, at one point in time, that county had one of the highest per capita income levels in the United States. So she took it upon herself to go around and talk to her neighbors and say, well, you've got four children. When you think about making your will, why don't you consider our hometown as one of those children and include them in your uh, financial planning and uh, charity work so that this community can go on in the future. She's done a wonderful job of doing that. Um, rural philanthropy research is another important component of what's going on, and I'll talk about that um, also just a little bit later. Uh, rural arts and, and uh, placemaking is a critical thing that's going on in, in a number of communities across the country. Uh, the Appalachian re region is uh, focusing on their small towns, and I'll also give you more additional information. And then a sustainable communities peer exchange, um, which I just love because it allows us to steal ideas from one another. Um, next, I want to talk specifically about the rural jobs. Ex uh, just a minute. I advanced. Now, I want to talk about the uh, transfer of wealth strategies. Um, and that really is promoting greater philanthropic resources um, to promote estate gifts to these place-based rural community endowments. Um, and there are three specific examples on this slide that point to the work that's being done through the Rural Community Development Initiative, RCDI, uh, $123,000 to the Telluride Foundation in Colorado, the $200,000 grant to the Montana Community Foundation, which you've just heard about, and that's a statewide effort, and then $200,000 to the Foundation of Appalachian, Ohio, um, which is a regional uh, effort in southeast Ohio and for those counties in that area. Um, <clears throat> also, I'll update you on this Rural Business Opportunity Grant. 
Um, that is funding a transfer of wealth study uh, now for the entire state of Missouri. Uh, the Foundation of Northwest Missouri received the grant and they're collaborating with nine other community foundations to cover the entire state. And their results of that study are due uh, next month, I believe. Uh, rural philanthropy research, uh, we have engaged uh, USDA's Economic Research Service in doing this analysis. Um, they've provided 50% of the research uh, dollars required, and then uh, the other 50% is being trans, um, provided by foundations, the Any Casey Foundation, Arkansas's Rasmussen Foundation, and the Bush Foundation in Minnesota. <clears throat> and that work is ongo ongoing, but uh, should be uh, ready to release here very, very shortly. Um, and that really is to provide us an understanding of what really is happening with foundation investments in rural America today. Uh, I've been de in the foundation, community foundation world for 20, 23 years now. And um, I have seen um, particularly the large national foundations kind of come and go in their emphasis on rural America. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to see those swings as leadership changes in those foundations. Uh, but I think there are real opportunities with some of the new uh, larger foundations that are being formed now and also through our corporate foundations. Um, I might stop here and uh, ask you to start thinking about some questions that we can utilize at the end of this presentation so that we can have a good discussion. Um, and the uh, the charts that are up on the webinar uh, with the results of a survey on how many of you are familiar with your local community foundations and uh, whether those foundations are active in your area is a good place to start. But um, very specifically, I'd like to hear what experiences you have had in working with philanthropic groups, whether they're community foundations or others and how we best engage these philanthropy organizations, whether it's on a national level or a regional level or even more local. And then how can we institutionalize a partnership between USDA and philanthropy? And finally, how can this effort best impact your communities and your work? Um, how can our philanthropy task force at USDA Rural Development uh, provide recommendations to the Undersecretary and, and the Secretary that will make a difference in the work that you do. Excuse me, I have an allergy and a cough. So, um, Next I wanted to talk about this Appalachian Town Technical Assistance Program. Um, you can see on, on the slide that there have been <clears throat> seven different communities uh, engaged in this economic revitalization. It's a partnership with the Appalachian Regional Commission, EPA, and with USDA providing the field engagement, although not the funding. And these communities are in Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, and again in West Virginia. <coughs> but there's no specific foundation funding yet. Um, I wanted to talk also, um, although it, potential next steps is on the slides, about some other things that are going on uh, across the country. Um, in Nebraska, we've had a $250,000 cooperative agreement uh, between USDA and the Nebraska Community Foundation to assist in building local capacity uh, and to secure increased investment in co community philanthropy. Um, <clears throat> Oregon and California, I know about these two because I'm here in Nebraska, but Oregon and California are going to be the recipients of 
uh, the work of a grant, an ARBEG grant, to the Heartland Center for Leadership in Nebraska, matched by the Ford Family Foundation of Oregon. And that is to <clears throat> work on leadership and entrepreneurship training in the rural, former timber uh, dependent areas of that region of the country. Um, Minnesota, I'm going to uh, give you some specific uh, instances of collaboration between rural development and uh, the initiative foundations in Minnesota. I believe there are seven of those. Um, New England has <clears throat> a USDA rural development $250,000 cooperative agreement uh, with the Farm to Institution New England and that's leveraged another $500,000. <clears> and that's uh, efforts on local foods. So there are many examples of this across the country of what's already going on. So potential next steps <clears throat> are to institutionalize this engagement practice within both rural development and USDA with the recommendations that will come forward from the Philanthropy Task Force. And we've uh, only met about three times so far, but we're hopeful that we can have the recommendations go forward at the end of this month or maybe in June. We also want to develop a proposal to support a very robust national transfer of wealth strategy aimed at local areas and rural areas. Um, there's been transfer of wealth studies done um, either statewide or regional in um, I think probably 85 to 90 percent of the states in the country um, and some of those states who did the early transfer of wealth studies have had uh, great results from that and it would be uh, very helpful I think to other states if we can share uh, the lessons learned and some of the unique ways that states are using transfer of wealth to increase endowments in their community foundations and other foundations. And then lastly, to harness philanthropy to support both regional and place-based initiatives. In, in our efforts to institutionalize this philanthropic engagement pra practice, uh, we need to continue the relationship with the Council on Foundations. And I think also, uh, and Donnell, you can uh, probably attest to this, with the regional associations of grants, grant makers and um, the regional groups of foundations across the country, and I think the Min Michigan Council on Foundations is an ex excellent example of that. Uh, and then instill this practice of collaboration and information exchange within USDA DA, and specifically the state offices and the field offices across the country. Um, one of the things that we've been discussing is the possibility of having regional meetings between USDA and key foundations, perhaps leading towards uh, a, a national gathering on this. And then uh, develop a proposal uh, to staff that would ensure philanthropic engagement capacity with career civil servants. So please ignore the misspelling on that slide. Um, in terms of uh, the transfer of wealth strategy and, and uh, developing that, uh, there are a number of stakeholders across the country who have been doing this work. Uh, Rupri comes to mind, the rural, uh, I can't remember what it stands for. I've used Rupri as an acronym for so long. Uh, the Aspen Institute, the uh, Center for Rural Strategies, and others and uh, how best to engage these regional foundations and national foundations to support at least a 10-year national rural strategy um, and how we can collectively support these transfer of wealth studies and utilizing them uh, in the work of community foundations and in rural communities. Um, next is uh,
uh, work on the Minnesota Rural Development um, between the USDA and the Initiative Foundations there. Um, the first example is the Initiative Foundation out of Little Falls, Minnesota. And USDA has provided funding for rural small business growth and community sustainability, uh, including the intermediary relending program grants, um, the rural business enterprise grant program. Probably everybody on, on the call knows these acronyms, but I'm trying to break my habit of using them all the time. Uh, and then the rural business opportunity grants and the rural community development initiative. So there are a number of grant making possibilities that can enhance the work of uh, initiative funds and community foundations across the country. Another uh, Minnesota example is also with uh, the Northwest Minnesota Foundation. Um, these two initiative funds were um, started by the McKnight Foundation many years ago, and um, they have been tremendous leaders in their region in Minnesota. And again, USDA Rural Development has provided funding to this particular initiative fund uh, with the RMAP program, IRPs, and RBEGs. And you can read there some of the uh, regional initiatives that they have helped with, component funds, asset building grants, uh, business development, and leadership development training. Uh, so those are examples of another state. Uh, and then I've got some examples of what we've done in Nebraska to kind of give you some more information of how we can collaborate with foundations and philanthropy along with USDA Rural Development. Um, one of my favorites is the expansion of the Auburn Memorial Library in southeast Nebraska that included uh, funding from the Union Pacific Foundation and the Peter Kiewit Foundation that are great funders in Nebraska for particularly construction programs. <clears throat> the community hospital out in McCook was one of our ARA uh, projects. It received a total of $32 million in funding, including some of the philanthropic funding. Um, and they are just doing the groundbreaking next week on the last phase, which is an oncology center. Uh, they'll have $2.3 million of rural development funds and $3.7 million in philanthropy funds. So it's a wonderful example of leveraging that can be done. In Ainsworth, uh, this is a library expansion that uh, included funding with, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Nebraska Library uh, Commission, and the U.S. Department of Commerce. So there are other um, groups outside of um, philanthropic groups that can be engaged in this as well. Uh, the next one is the Village of Cody. This is one of my favorites because not only did it have philanthropic dollars, but it had a lot of sweat equity in it. Uh, this is a straw bale building that has been built as an incubator up in the Sand Hills area of, of uh, north central Nebraska. And the high school students particularly have been involved in actually construction, constructing the building, and they will uh, run the grocery store that just uh, opened up this month. And uh, the Sherwood Foundation, which is a local foundation, part of the Buffett uh, group of foundations in Omaha, is among the contributors to that project. And then uh, two more. One is the O'Neill Community Foundation, which um, Development Corporation, which built a new community center there. And uh, they were able to pull together almost $730,000 of charitable donations from residents and small local foundations in their community. And then the Panhandle Rural Electric uh, Membership Association. This is one of our power, public power districts that was eligible for um, our U.S. funding through the Rural Economic Development Loan Program. It was our first million dollar program in Nebraska. 
and the Shadron State College Foundation matched it with $2 million of philanthropic dollars um, to complete the phase one of the project, which will have its grand opening in September. So that's uh, developing a new rangeland agriculture center and pavilion on the college campus. So those are my slide presentations, uh, and I'd love to go through some of these questions and get your input on it. Um, are there any questions uh, in the chat room at this point? Does anyone have any questions? Um, we would love to get your suggestions as to how we best uh, make recommendations uh, to the undersecretary. Um, what things can you see that we can do at a national and a regional level that would help you uh, engage partnerships with philanthropy in your state? Maxine, uh, this is Dave Sears, uh, RD National Office. Um, number one, thank you very much for the uh, great presentation. Um, here's here's uh, an assignment that uh, everybody from RD or most of the people from RD know about, and that is um, each state is uh, requested to prepare a community and economic development inventory of partner organizations in the state. Um, it would seem like in at least some states, uh, maybe all states, that some of those key partners would be uh, foundations and other uh, philanthropies. So um, I just wonder if, if there's something explicit that uh, you and your task force might want to do in terms of, I don't know, sending an email out to all the RD state directors or something, and sort of just a, just a reminder that uh, when you're thinking about partners, don't forget about uh, your foundations and, uh, and uh, philanthropic organizations. Exactly, and uh, the Council on Foundations website that uh, has been given to everybody is a source not only for the community foundations in your area, but also um, the other private foundations that are in existence and, and work in your state. So that's a good resource to go to to get that kind of information if you don't already have it. Um, Maxine, uh, this is Carol Blackman from Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm not sure if this is already in the works or not. I have been trying to take notes, but I've heard so much information and um, just wondered if maybe the um, state rural development offices might serve as um, a convener to start some of these conversations in regions or states where they're not happening already. I, I think that would be wonderful if we can do it. Um, in some of our conversations on our task force so far, uh, we have talked about that exactly. And, you know, some states are already doing it, and they could provide their experiences on how best to go about that. Um, and then, you know, it, maybe it makes sense to pilot it in a few states, and then depending on that, take it up to a regional basis and then the national basis. Um, but I know in the South there are some marvelous partners down there. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is in North Carolina with the Rural Development Center there. Uh, but I, I'm sure that there are state and regional foundations that would react very positively to outreach by the state offices from USDA Rural Development. Um, it's just a matter of, of uh, finding them and reaching out. Yes. 
This is Brian Queen in North Carolina. One thing that uh, popped in my head is uh, the lady uh, that was presenting before you, Maxine, uh, mentioned you know the, the national foundations and how they, uh, I guess, were tiered uh, to more local foundations. And I'm, I may not be describing her exact statements right. Uh, could you explain maybe how, you know, if you had a local region, let's say, of three or four counties or whatever it may be, and you were talking about, you know, establishing from more of a, whether it be a statewide foundation or even a national foundation, uh, details on how that works. And, and I think part of your comment was uh, referencing, uh, you know, not having to go through all the tax loopholes of setting up your own private 501c3, just essentially uh, an umbrella under the parent 501c3, so to say. Uh, it, it was, and I guess, you know, as we've been going on uh, through these calls and these meetings uh, of trying to, to, to maybe ID, you know, where we can take a national foundation and where maybe they're having more of a local uh, impact, whether it be in our state or our, our region that we're working with. And, and maybe that, maybe I'm uh, thinking something is existing when it's not, but if it is, that's something we can definitely uh, start to work on. Well, I can share a little bit of the experiences we had in Nebraska when we looked at the possibility of forming a statewide community foundation. Um, and we looked at the model in South Dakota because we had good connections with our neighbors to the to the north. And we looked at the model in the Delta region uh, and a couple of other statewide foundations. And some of those Statewide community foundations really focus on building resources on a statewide basis. So they build funds that um, are established by the givers um, that are targeted in the way that the uh, giver wishes them to be. Others uh, have taken the model we've used in Nebraska, which is we, prov um, we help communities establish their own community foundation funds. Um, we also help donors do scholarship funds. Uh, we've helped uh, organizations that want to do a specific economic development related activity. Um, there are probably, I think, well, there are well over 200 different affiliated funds with un under the umbrella of the Nebraska Community Foundation now. Um, and actually, it's ridiculously easy for a community to start a community fund under that umbrella uh, because they have the immediate access to the 501c3 of the Nebraska Community Foundation. And, um, and what the Nebraska Community Foundation staff has focused on is providing back office support for all of these community funds so they don't have to worry about um, depositing the checks, making sure that the um, checks to the investments are made out properly, that an audit takes place every year, that the IRS reports are filed, all of those kinds of things. But they also provide training and leadership support to those local community funds. Um, so that the local people who are all volunteers can focus on reaching out to their neighbors to raise the funds and then make the decisions as how the investments are going to be made back in their community. I'm obviously a proponent of that kind of uh, approach with a statewide community foundation, but there are other models that work very, very well as, in addition. Does that help or get at your question? Yeah, because I, you know, I think the, the first, and I guess I don't want to get too deep. I know this is a, a national call, and this may be more tailored to, to our our task force. There is, you know, my my first initial thought is get you know engaging with the North Carolina Community Foundation, which in 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 its essence, all of its affiliates reach across the state. And so, um, if that's already been done um, in other states, which it has, obviously, then that's something we can just. Uh, you know, build off of and, and tailor. So, mm -hmm. good. Any other questions or advice to our task force?
I will give you an example in Minnesota. This is Kathy Coyle. I now work in North Dakota. Um, I'm a volunteer at the Lakes Crisis Center dealing with domestic violence. And they were going to build a $3 million shelter for women and children. Um, they applied to rural development. They did a ton of paperwork. They thought they were really diligent in their application process. But the end result was that there had been some turning of the soil. They actually hadn't started the foundation or anything, but they had turned the soil. So it made it before they applied. So it made their application um, not eligible for a sizable a grant or loan for the building. Instead, uh, they're only able to get a more modest amount of money for death and computers and that sort of thing. So my my advice is that rural development, once again, look at its regulations. I mean, I can understand why that is a regulation, but at the same time, if its true mission is to help, it was counterproductive. Right. And I, I, that's one of the things that I always caution uh, communities about is to make sure they get the rural development staff engaged with them at the very beginning so that these kinds of problems can be headed off. Um, I just gave a presentation to one of our federally recognized tribes yesterday and, and that's one of the first messages I give them is, is you know, our staff is here to help you and uh, they can help you determine the best way of realizing your goals and your missions. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, and I'm assuming that was a community facilities application. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I I will take note of that and bring it up when I have the opportunity to do so. Okay. Well, and along with that just goes and this is not anything new, but for us, rural development, to dumb down our regulations, and I know that they're working on that, to try to make them more readable so you don't have to be a lawyer to be able to understand our regulations and our application process. Thanks. I, w I will uh, bring both of those messages. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much for giving me this time to, to share what's going on in engagement, not only with community foundations, but also uh, private foundations, corporate foundations, uh, and to get some input on what we're trying to accomplish through our Rural Philanthropy Task Force at USDA Rural Development. Uh, this is Dave Sears from RD National Office, and I just want to thank you, Maxine. Uh, excellent and thought-provoking uh, and informative presentation, and I also want to thank our presenters from Montana. Very nice job in the first hour. So. Thank, thank, thank you, you all, and I hope that uh, those of you uh, who have uh, listened in have found it uh, to be really, really useful, and perhaps it will make a difference in the way that uh, you do your job over the coming months. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.